السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وانهتدى بهديه وانتهج نهجه إلى يوم الدين تركنا المحجة البيضاء ليلها كان هارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك وبعد أسعد الله أوقاتكم ورمضان كريم We are in the third day of Ramadan or the second day of Ramadan depending on where you began fasting or when you began fasting and we are looking at the ajza, the 30 parts of the Qur'an al-Kareem and we have arrived to the third part of uh, the Qur'an al-Juz al-Thalith and this is the juz that begins in the latter part of Surah al-Baqarah beginning with tilka al-Rusulu fadhalna ba'adahum ala ba'd and in this particular juz we have the end of Surah al-Baqarah and then the beginning of the next surah, Surah Ali Imran or the family of Imran and we see certain themes here in the beginning of the juz, which we'll talk about in a second, we see this concept of the tafdil and the hierarchy uh, amongst created beings and the hierarchy amongst prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the determinant of. And he mentions that he has preferred or has given fadl, uh, has given some virtues to some prophets that he has not given to others. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means exactly shortly. And then we see the greatest ayah in the Qur'an, at least according to some of the hadith, the Sahih, in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari, ayat al-Kursi, or the ayah of the throne. And then after that, we see the uh, interaction that happened between Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and Nimrud, so Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and the corrupt king, uh, Nimrod, or Nimrud, and the Muhajja, and how Ibrahim salam handled that with Ibn uh, Numrud uh, being one of the few people that are mentioned in the Qur'an, al-Uluhiyya, that he claimed to be a god himself, much in the same way as Pharaoh with uh, Musa, with Moses salam. And then at the end of the surah, we see some of the adab and the etiquettes dealing with al-infaq, dealing with sadaqat, dealing with uh, paying charity, and the state of the heart. Of, of one when they're giving charity and also the uh, benefits and fada'il, the virtues of giving charity. And that includes also ayat al-dayn, the ayah that deals with uh, the etiquette of recording a debt. And then the surah ends with khawatim uh, surah al-Baqarah, the one that the Prophet ﷺ said if you were decided every night then you'd be uh, safe from harm and safe from the uh, lamma or the touch of Satan. Uh, for the duration of the night, and that's the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. And we'll talk about that also. Then we'll go into Surah Ali Imran, and then Surah Ali Imran talks about Al-Ayat Al-Muhkamat, talks about the commanding verses of the Qur'an, and also the Mutashabihat, those that are more ambiguous in nature in terms of their meaning, which we also will talk about shortly. And then uh, towards the end of the Juz, we see the recounting uh, that's happened several times in the Qur'an the, of Isa and Maryam or Isa the son of Mary, Jesus the son of Mary that happens in Surah Ali Imran and also happens in uh, Surah Maryam named after Maryam alayhi salam. So those are kind of the major themes that we see in the Juz. Uh, we'll look at some of the specific verses addressing those themes. So the first verse that we spoke about or that we mentioned uh, after A'udhu Allahi min Shaitan Rajeem Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. تلك الرسل فضلنا بعضهم على بعض منهم من كلم الله ورفع بعضهم درجات وآتينا عيسى بن مريم البينات وأيدناه بروح القدس ولو شاء الله ما قتل الذين من بعدهم من بعد ما جاءتهم البينات ولكن اختلفوا فمنهم من آمن ومنهم من كفر ولو شاء الله ما قتل ولكن الله يفعل ما يريد so these are the messengers that we have preferred or have given fadl, virtue, some over the other. So um, we also see in Khawatim Surah Al-Baqarah that لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا So the believers say that we do not make any distinction between the messengers and the prophets. How do we understand that? How do we reconcile that meaning in the meaning that we see here? Just a few verses before it. تلك الرسل فضلنا بعضهم على بعض. These are the messengers that we have given fadl, virtue some over the others. 
Well, the next part of the ayah explains that. مِنْهُمْ مَنْ كَلَّمَ الله. Some of them are amongst them or from them that Allah has spoken to. And uh, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, he's referred to as Kalimullah. Kalimullah means the one that was spoken to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa alayhi salam, uh, when he saw the burning or the kindling bush or the burning bush and he went to see what that was, then this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him what he revealed and spoke to him in a manner that is commensurate with the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was, we know definitely it was without sound or without letter, uh, without pronunciation, but in a manner that is commensurate and applicable to the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is otherwise unknown to us. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also spoke to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu on the night of the Isra and the Mi'raj, the ascension of Muhammad sallallahu So these are things that were given to some prophets that were not given to others. So we don't have a record, for example, that or uh, mentioned in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to any of the other prophets like uh, Dawood or Sulaiman or uh, Idris, for example. Yes, there was wahi, but here al-kalam yani, is a special type of wahi, is a special type of revelation. Most of the time wahi comes from when wara'i hijab, as the Quran mentions, from behind a barrier or behind a veil. But to some of the chosen prophets, uh, like Musa and like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, this was given to them. darajat, And some of them were raised in degrees. So even though the Prophet sallallahu in his humility, he would say to the Sahaba, لا تفضلوني على Yunus ibn Matta or لا تخيروا بين الأنبياء uh, Some of those hadith, and do not prefer me over Yunus ibn Matta, the one who is in the belly of the whale, and do not choose between the prophets and messengers. Here, this meaning is that we have equal affirmation of the prophecy and prophethood and the messengerhood of all of the prophets. Those that are mentioned in the Quran and those that we believe existed even though they were not mentioned by name in the Quran. Because there were people from other nations, other communities before the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, who believed in some and disbelieved in others. And so the idea is you accept all of them. And so uh, we believe as Muslims that we are the final revelation so we accept all of the biblical prophets that are mentioned in the Bible and all the prophets that are mentioned in the Torah. And we find that between those two, they don't accept all of those particular prophets. But we accept Jesus السلام, as a prophet and messenger of Allah. وَرُوحُ And also the spirit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned in the Quran. In addition to Muhammad So uh, this is the raising in degrees. وَأَتَيْنَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْمِ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ Right? And we gave Jesus, the son of Mary, the bayinat, the clear signs, and we aided him with the Holy Spirit. So here the Holy Spirit in the Muslim context is Jibreel, the Archangel Jibreel or Gabriel alayhi salam. So there's not a thing that he did except Jibreel alayhi salam was with uh, the Prophet Isa and also the Prophet Musa and the Prophet Muhammad, all of the Prophets, as he is the angel, the Archangel of Revelation. And then if we move on and skip a little bit forward and we see uh, we get to Ayat al-Kursi uh, the Ayat of the Throne where Allah SWT says and many of us have it memorized Allahu la ilaha illa wal hayy al-qayyum la ta'khuduhu sinatu wa la nawm lahu ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard man dha alladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi-ithni ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَؤُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Allah is the only one, there is none but He. الْحَيُّ الْقَيُّومُ The one that is alive, the one is Qayyum, and the Qayyum is the one who is not only self-sufficient, but is the sufficient cause for everyone else. So Allah SWT قَائِمْ بُنَفْسِهِ As we say in theology and aqeedah, وَهُوَ الْقَيُّومُ يعني يَقُومُ غَيْرُهُ بِهِ That others have no way to exist or to maintain their existence or to remain in existence or come out of non-existence into existence except by the qayyumiyyah, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, granting them the gift and the favor of bringing them into existence and then continuing their existence after that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously creating and maintaining the existence of all of creation. And then Allah says, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. 
So he doesn't have a subtle lapse, nor does he sleep. Because you might say, well, all of that work to keep the universe running, if we were to compare it to a human being, how would that work? Well, Allah is not like a human being. Everything in the heavens and the earth is his. Who will make intercession? Who will intercede in the next day, in the day of judgment? Except by his will, by his permission. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, will be given the greatest intercession, which is when the intercession for the reckoning will begin. We will all be gathered in the area, the plain that Allah will recreate or create initially for us. Uh, and all of the billions of people who have ever lived will be gathered there and they will all be seeking for the reckoning to begin. Some will be standing up to their ankles in their sweat, some to their knees, some to their necks, some will be immersed. And they will all look for a prophet to make intercession for them. All of them will refuse except when they finally ask the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and he says, Ana laha. I am for that intercession. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Allah knows everything about us, that which is right before us and that which is behind us or within us. There's nothing we can hide from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ But we know nothing about him except that which Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us to know. And no one can encompass everything that is to be known by, about Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala truly knows Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So the kursi is one of the uh, created things of al-malakut, alam al-malakut, not alam al-ghayb, not alam al-shahada, ولكن alam al-malakut, which is the other realm, that is the unseen realm, alam al-ghayb, and we don't know exactly what it looks like and so forth, but here it said, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ It expands the heavens and the earth. So everything in the alam al-malakut is on a much grander scale, both in terms of magnitude and of uh, quality, and of uh, existence than anything that we know in this life. So anything that's mentioned of alam and malakut or the next life or things we cannot possibly see now, then it's incumbent upon a believer to hold them to, as to be true and existing to believe in them. And we don't have to have a specific belief about what they look like or how they actually are because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have not necessarily revealed that to us, at least not in the Quran. وَلَا يُؤُوذُ حِفْظُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Right? And it is not a burden upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve them, the heavens and the earth, and everything that is in between them, including the kursi and alam al-malakut, wa alam al-jinn, wa alam al-ins, all of these different realms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, the maintainer, the, and the sovereign over all. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي There is no compulsion in religion. And this verse it means that no one can compel someone else to take on a deen or take on a belief that is not already in their heart. That is something you have to have your own personal conviction about. قَدْ تَبَيَّنَ الرُّشْدُ مِنَ الْغَيْ Guidance has clearly been made, uh, has been elucidated, made clear from misguidance. فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى لَمْ فِصَامَ لَهَا وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ So whoever believes Whoever disbelieves in the taghut, and this word taghut is interesting, it's a singular word. It's uh, jama is tawaghit, and taghut means anything that is worshipped without right other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And certainly anything that is indeed worshipped other than Allah has no right to be worshipped. And so that's called the taghut. Whether it's a person, whether it's an idol, whether it's your own nafs, your own hawa, your own caprice, all of that is tawaghit. فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالْتَاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ So whoever disbelieves in the taghut, in other words, as something that they should worship as a god, or treat as a god, وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ And they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe in Allah, فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى Then they would have, hold on to this عُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى, this thing that they hold on to very strongly, uh, uh, very affirmedly. لَا انْفِصَامَ لَهَا لَا انْكِصَارَ لَهَا وَلَا انْفِصَارَ It will never break, it will never be snapped. Then that is the, the right guided straight path. وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ And Allah see, hears all things and knows all things. اللَّهُ وَلِيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ Allah is the wali, yani the guardian and the protector of the people who believe. He takes them out of the ظُلُمَات إِلَى النُّورِ Out of the darknesses into the light. And here the word darkness is in plural and light is in singular. Because the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of Allah, not anyone else's. 
right? As the Prophet ﷺ said, الظلم ظلمات uh, Wrongful action, oppression are many different varieties and colors, but it leads to ظلمات, to many darknesses. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاءُهُمُ الطَّاغُوتِ يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظلمات. And as for those who disbelieve, their awliya, awliya'uhum, see how it's plural here, and in the first part of the verse, Allahu waliyu al-ladina amanu, hina wal-ladina kafiru awliya'uhum, their guardians and protectors are the taghut, anything taken other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a, as a god, yukhrijunahum mina nuri ila dhulumat, they take them out of the light, out of the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the darknesses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that, adhullah min dhalik. Then we get to the story of Ibrahim and Namrud, and where Allah says, "O kaladi, marra ala qarya wa hiya khawiya arushiha, qala anna yuhi hadhi Allahu baad mautiha." Oh, and have you not seen this town? The one who passed by this town, wa hiya khawiya, and it is completely devoid of any civilization. It is just ruins. Khawiya arushiha. And in some of the tafsir that they say that this town was Beit al-Maqdis, was Jerusalem back then. قَالَ أَنَّ يُحْيِ هَذِهِ اللَّهُ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا So then, who will give life to this place after it is dead? فَمَاتَهُ مِئَةَ عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعَثَ So this story is actually about Sayyidina al-Uzair. And al-Uzair was one of the prophets of Bani Israel, and he came by. Beit al-Maqdis or Jerusalem, founded in ruins. And then he said, who can give life to this thing after it is dead? So he went to sleep for a hundred years. Or he actually was in a, in, died for a hundred years, as the, the verse states here. Very similar to the Ashab al-Kahf, who were asleep for 309 years. Then he was resurrected. It was said to him, how long have you been asleep? How long have you been gone? He said, maybe a day or less than a day. Because it said that he had, his ruh was taken, his soul was taken in the morning. And then when he came back, even though it was a hundred years, it was in the evening. So he thought he slept part of the day. Rather, you have been gone a hundred years. فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِكَ وَشَرَابِكَ لَمْ Look to the food that you have and the drink that you have. Allah has preserved it. Lam yatasanna. Wanzur ila himadika. But look to your donkey that you're riding. Completely bones. After a hundred years, obviously. Walinaja'alaka ayatal linnas. And we'll make you a sign for the people. Wanzur ila idami kaifa nun shizuha thumma naksuha lahma. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected the donkey and with the bone and the flesh and all everything came back. Thumma naksuha lahma. Then its flesh was put back, back, back on. فَلَمَّ تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ قَالَ أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ And then it was made clear to him, he said, أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ I know that Allah has power over all things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to resurrect, to bring life, to bring death, as we know. And that will be the final um, act, so to speak, in creation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will, we will die and we'll be brought back to life. So why would it be difficult to believe? that he can do it uh, in this particular instance. And then Ibrahim, alayhi salam, before uh, uh, he deals with Namrud, he says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى Oh Allah, show me how you give life to death. قَالَ أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ Do you not believe? This is Allah speaking to Ibrahim. قَالَ بَلَى وَلَكِنْ يَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِي He said, of course, but I want تُمَئْنِينَ I want thabat. I want to see how it's done so that my heart will even have more assurity, more certainty. So then Allah granted his request. He said, فَخُذْ أَرْبَعَةً مِنَ الطَّيْرِ فَصُرْهُنَّ إِلَيْكَ ثُمَّ جَعَلَ كُلِّ جَبَلْ مِنْهُنَّ جُزْءًا ثُمَّ دُرُهُنَّ يَأْتِينَكَ سَعْيَا وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ So it said that this particular verse is referring that he's, Allah told him, take four birds for different types of birds. And it said that he took a hawk, he took a falcon, he took a pigeon, he took a dove or a chicken, and cut them up into pieces, and then spread them around on different parts of uh, the mountain. And then he called for them, 
and then each piece came back to the piece that it's supposed to be with. So the hawk was resurrected, and the falcon, and the chicken, and the dove, whatever the case may be, and they came to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then that's when Allah SWT said to him, وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ أَنَّ اللَّهَ فِي عِزَّتِهِ He is Aziz and he is Hakim. Then we get to the adab and the virtues of spending in the way of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالٌ فِي سَبِيلِ لَيْكَ مَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَمْبَتَتْ سَبَعْ سَنَابِلْ فِي كُلِّ سُمْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ وَاللَّهُ يُضَاعِفُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ أَلَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ لَا يُتْبِعُونَ مَا أَنْفَقُوا مَنًّا وَلَا أَذًى لَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ The people who spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are like a habba, like a kernel from the, from the corn, أَمْبَتَتْ سَبَعْ سَنَابِلْ that it had uh, seven stalks. And with each in one of those, there are mi'atu habba, there are a hundred kernels. So that's like times 700. And we see that often in mentioned in the hadith. Like in here in this month of fasting, when Allah says in the hadith of Qudsi, As-siyamu li wa ila Fasting is uniquely for me, and it's done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no hadhi nafs, there's no allotment of the ego in it, because fasting is something that cannot be observed by others. And he said, it's for yukni for me, and I will reward to it up to 700. So the word 700, they say, la mafuma lahu, or ghir ma'qul, which means, doesn't mean exactly 700, but it means many, many times. Like when someone says, you know, I told you a million times. It's not a million times, but it's an exaggeration understood to mean many, many times. Wallahu yudha'ifu li man yasha'. And Allah can multiply for whom he wills. Wallahu wa yasirun alim. But there is an adab that comes with this virtue. So Allah states the virtue of spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there are certain adab and etiquettes in order to avail oneself of that complete uh, multiplied reward. <laughs> Those who spend in the way of Allah, <laughs> but they do not follow after what they have spent. <laughs> so they do not follow what they spent. <laughs> And in the verse that comes later, يَا أَيُّ لِذِي الْآمَنُ لَا تُبْتُولُوا صَدَقَاتِكُمْ بِالْمَنِّ وَالْأَذَى Do not ruin or corrupt your sadaqat, your charity, by following with al-man wal-adha. What is this al-man or al-imtinan? It means that the giver feels entitled to a measure of gratitude from the receiver. So that's more a matter of the heart. That's an internal thing. And Allah begins with that. لا ثم لا يتبعون ما أنفقوا منا ولا أذى. So the man is feeling this person should be grateful for me. I did this for them. When in actuality it should be the other way around. Allah SWT has commanded you, and He has made incumbent upon you to spend in charity of that which Allah has actually given to you to begin with. It's not yours to begin with. You are a steward over it. You're someone who's been put put in a trust over it. And Allah is the one is the giver, and Allah is the one is the receiver. So He's asking you to give, and then to His stated recipients. So if that's the case, you should not feel then that people should be indebted to you and owe you a measure of gratitude. That would be a way of ruining the whole idea of zakat, right? which is purification. So zakat is purification of your wealth, but it's also purification of your heart. وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ right? And so, uh, جوز عَمَّا وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ And you give money and you give charity even though you love it. And when you love something, you don't want to part with it. But it's a measure of your sitq. That's why the sadaqah comes from the same word as sitq, which means sincerity, ikhlas. So it's a measure of your sincerity when you give out of things that you love. Wala adha, or harm, or damage, or hurt. Here, adha means something that you said to the person who's the recipient. Like, oh, make sure you spend this in the right way, or there's no, no more of this coming your way, or something of this sort. Or to seek... Uh, recognition or accolades or something like that based upon the charity that you give. And the best type of charity is the silent charity, except for the zakah, they said. So zakah is obligatory, and if you do it with intention outwardly or publicly so that people can follow you and establish the zakah as an institution, then that is a good intention. But otherwise, if it's sadaqat, something that's voluntary, then it's best not to make it public. And it's even best for the person who is a recipient of your sadaqah not to know who you are. 
and perhaps even an added measure that you don't know who they are either, uh, so that it's closest to sincerity. Such people then, لَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عَنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Such people then will have a great reward. وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And they will have no fear and no grief. It's interesting, the same exact words are used in Surah Yunus to talk about the awliya. إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ So as if the one who gives sadaqah in this manner, in a saintly manner, in an ihsani way, then they are from the awliya. بِدَلِيلْ هَذِي الْآيَةِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ صَدَقَةٍ يَتْبَعُهَا أَذَى وَاللَّهُ غَنِيٌّ حَنِيمٌ يَا أَيُّ so all of that is from the adab and emphasizing the point. A good word and forgiveness is better than a charity that is followed by harm, that is followed by hurt in the manner that we mentioned earlier. Wallahu ghaniyun halim. Wallahu ghani, he is a not in need, he is the one who has all the wealth, all the treasures of Ar-Rahman, and he's also halim. And he is pardoning, he has clemency, and he is clement. Ya ayu ladina amanu la tubitul sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha, as we just mentioned. Don't ruin your or corrupt your sadaqat. Bil manni wal adha. And then there's more verses about that um, that talk about some of the adab of the sadaqat and the virtues of the sadaqat. And then Ayat al Dain comes shortly after that, which we won't go over, but it talks about how. Uh, debts should be secured either by documentation or by collateral. And as we know, many of the ahkam, if not the vast majority of them, have some basis in the Qur'an. And when it's mentioned in the Qur'an in this particular way, then that indicates um, a, uh, a kind of a permanency and uh, importance that it's mentioned in in the scripture that is qatai, that is unequivocal in terms of its veracity, then it means that's something that's not going to be abrogated or understood in a different light. Wallahu a'lam. The Khawatim Surah Al-Baqarah, which basically starts from verse 284, where Allah SWT says, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَإِن تُبْدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ تُخْفُوهُ يُحَاسِبُكُمْ بِهِ اللَّهِ Everything in the heavens and the earth is for Allah. And if you show that which is in, within yourselves, or you hide it, يُحَاسِبِكُمْ بِهِ اللَّهِ Allah will take you into account. فَيَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُعَذِبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ So Allah forgives whom He pleases, and He will take the task whom He pleases, and He has power over all things. آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ هنا رسول سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the Messenger has believed in everything that has been revealed to him from his Lord, as well as the believers. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌّ آمَنَ They have all believed in بِاللَّهِ with Allah وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ His angels, his books, his messengers, رُسُلِهِ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِنْ رُسُلِهِ This is what we refer to earlier. There is no distinction made between the messengers and that they are all messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا And they say, we hear and we obey. وفرانك, and we seek your forgiveness. ربنا, our Lord, إليك المصير, and to you is the final abode. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not put upon a soul a burden more than it can bear. لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت. It will earn, or for it is that which it earns in terms of good. وعليها ما اكتسبت. And also against it, that which it has done against itself. And here, just Arabic language. There's a difference between the word kasaba wa ktasaba. Kasaba means to earn something easily. So Allah uses that word when we earn good deeds and reward easily. Allah makes it easy for us. Wa alayha maktasabat. But against it is al iktisab. And the iktisab means something that is done with struggle, with effort. So it takes effort to incur sins. Because even if you think about it, but you say to yourself, I'm not going to do it, then it doesn't count for you. It actually counts as a hasana. وَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرَةِ أَمْثَالِهَا And one good deed counts as ten, and one bad deed counts as one. So you can see the ten to one ratio, how Allah used the verb kasaba in terms of good deeds, وَاكْتَسَبَ in terms of bad deeds. رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِنَّ نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا 
Allah do not take us to task if we forget or if we commit an error, make a mistake. And this is one of the khasa'is of al-Umm al-Muhammadiyya, that we're not taken to task if we do something out of, uh, out of forgetfulness or out of an honest mistake. And that's one of our khasa'is, one of the things specific to this ummah. And that is a great, great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رَبَّنَا وَلَا تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْنَا إِسْرًا كَمَا حَمَلْتَهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا Oh Allah, do not, oh our Lord, do not put a burden upon us that is uh, heavy and that you have put on those before us. So we have nothing in our sharia that is burdensome. There's nothing in our sharia that is a form of punishment to us for our past sins. Everything in our sharia, everything that is halal is good and everything that haram is khabith and is not good. رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمِّنَّا مَا لَا طَاقَتَنَا بِهِ Don't give us a burden that we don't have any power over it. وَعَفُ عَنَّا وَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَرْحَمْنَا And pardon us and forgive us and have mercy upon us. أَنْتَ مَوْلَانَا فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ You are a master and our sovereign, so give us help and victory over الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ The party of the disbelievers. And that's the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. Next, we go into Surah Ali Imran, which we'll just touch upon brief, briefly. So, uh, Ali Imran is also a surah that begins with Alif Lam Mim, in the same way as Surah Al Baqarah, but then the second verse is different. Allahu la ilaha al Hayyu al Qayyum, very similar to Ayatul Kursi. Allah is the only one, no, but none but He, Al Hayyu al Qayyum, the one that is alive, the one that is Qayyum, which we explained. Nazzala alayk al Kitab bil Haqq. Remember when we said second person is speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad. نزل عليك الكتاب بالحق مصدقا لما بين يدي. And we said Islam is the final revelation, or the Sharia of Muhammad is the final revelation, but it affirms and confirms all that came before that. That's what مصدقا لما بين يدي وأنزل التوراة والإنجيل. Because Allah also is the one who revealed the Torah and the Injil, the Gospel. من قبل from before, before the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. هدى للناس guidance for the people. وَأَنزَلَ الْفُرْقَانِ The Furqan is that which distinguishes between truth and falsehood, which are all the sacred books. So if you have the knowledge of the book, then you have the knowledge of the Furqan, which is to separate between truth and falsehood. So separating between truth and falsehood is not merely a rational exercise, it's a spiritual one. It takes spiritual cognition, and it takes spiritual fortification and purification to be able to distinguish between truth and falsehood. And that has always been a universal truth, for all of our human history. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَدِيرٌ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ ذُو انْتِقَامٌ Those who disbelieve in the uh, verses or the ayahs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have a strict chastisement or punishment. وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ Right, this word aziz, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most high in his dignity, ذُو انْتِقَامٌ And will avenge those who disbelieve or against those who disbelieve. So, I think... Uh, I just want to uh, read the verse that comes after that that deals with al-ayat al-muhkamat wal mutashabihat as we mentioned earlier. هو الذي أنزل عليك الكتاب منه آيات محكمات. He is the one who has revealed to you also to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم آيات محكمات, commanding verses. هن أم الكتاب. They are the mother of the book, which means they are the foundation of the book, the commanding verses. So the vast majority of the verses in the Quran even though they can have multiple interpretations, are very clear and unambiguous. وَأُخَرُ However, أُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتِ There are some that are mutashabihat that you may not ever know the true meaning of. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, Alif Lam Mim is one of the ayat al-mutashabihat. So the letters that, become, that come at the beginning of the verse, as we said about Surah Al-Baqarah, can have many, many different interpretations, but nobody knows for certain what they mean. Only Allah knows. So they're not a mystery, they're a secret. A mystery means nobody, nobody knows them. A secret means some people can know them and they can reveal the meanings of which to some people. So there may be some of the awliya of Allah that Allah has revealed some of these meanings to them. Wallahu a'lam. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَ مِنْهُ اتِّغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَبِتِّغَاءَ تَأْوِينِ However, what should be our stance in terms of the commanding verses and al-ayat al-mutashabihat and the ambiguous ones? He said, as for those who have zayg in their heart, yani al-mayl or al-inhiraf and al-haq, you know, steering away from the truth, فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ بِتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ Then they follow and try to 
make interpretations seeking fitna and tribulations. There's two ways to read this next part of the verse. And this is something that we study in aqeed and theology. So we can either stop on loves of Jalala and we say, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ No one knows the true interpretation except Allah, full stop, and no one else. And they say, this is madhab al-salaf. So when it comes to al-ayat al-mutashabihat, that seem to anthropomorphize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he has a limb or a hand or something like that. يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ الرَّحْمَنَ عَرْشُ اسْتَوَى This is called from al-ayat al-mutashabihat. And so madhab al-salaf or the, the pious predecessors is to believe in them as they come and leave the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Imam al-Dadir says, ma nafi al-zahir, but to negate the outward meaning because that's impossible. Allah cannot have limbs. He's not a jism. He's not a body. So we don't assign limbs to him. But as to the true meaning of the verse, Allah knows. وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ أَمَنَّا بِهِ كُلُّ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّمَا وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ And those well versed in knowledge, they say, أَمَنَّا بِهِ كُلُّ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا We believe in it, it's all from Allah. Which is what I just described now about the ayat al-Mushabihat. وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ And that's not min maqbul al-qawl. This is Allah saying, وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ And the only ones who remember are those of al-bab, of lub, of uqul, of, of sound intellect and sound heart, of essence. That's one way to read the verse. The other way to read it, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ So we include the rasikhuna fil ilm in those, those well grounded in knowledge and those that know the interpretation or that may know the interpretation. Yaquluna, they say, Amanna bihi kullu min indi rabbina. They say we believe in it, it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's called madhab al khalaf. And madhab al khalaf is those that came later when for many members of the ummah it did not suffice them to say just believe in it as it come and leave it to Allah. As our history has progressed and as people have less faith and less certainty, it's difficult to say to them, just leave it to Allah and don't worry about it. They want answers. They want to get to the bottom of it. And so Al-Khalaf, uh, the, uh, the pious successors, realized this about the Ummah. And so they made efforts at interpretation. But at the same time, they didn't do it with absolute certainty. So they said, the hand of God that's mentioned in the Quran, Awiyad Allah, is quwwatuhu, is his power. Allah descends to the lowest heaven on the last third of the night. That his mercy is what descends, and so forth. So both uh, are part of our uh, uh, understanding of Islam, and both uh, faithfully and clearly depict our aqidah and that which we uh, hold to be true. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who have certainty and increase certainty and stick to truth and uh, avoid the falsehood. إنه لي ذلك والقادر عليه والحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.